you've uh, all refreshed from your coffee and cake. Um, the next session is our not quite um, picture culture session, three minute presentations. We, I think, will only have the first two speakers. Um, Fiona, unfortunately, I think has got childcare issues. She might yet make a late appearance, but we'll stick to the, the three minute format for each of the speakers. Um, I'm going to do what I always tell my students not to do and make assumptions about the audience. Um, first is that you're all on the right side of the digital divide and can access the internet and the symposium website and having got there that you can all read and uh, check out the bios of the speakers so we don't need to have uh, long introductions for them. So without further ado I will hand over to uh, our first speaker uh, Michael uh, Newton. Well, as most of you will know, doing any sort of digital humanities projects is very expensive. How do you create uh, the software to begin with, maintaining it, data uh, maintenance issues, uh, sustenance. So one of the main goals of the Digital Innovation Lab at University of North Carolina has been creating platforms and tools that are free, that are easy to use, and that are repurposable so that anybody can configure them for a new data set and a new domain. So we chose because of the um, currency of WordPress to adopt that as a content management system and to create a plugin for that that would allow digital humanities projects to be run on that platform. And then you kind of get a free ride as WordPress is developed and evolves. You, you go along with that and you don't have to do that part of the infrastructure. So that's, that's kind of the background about what this tool is, what this platform is and how it works. In WordPress, there are different user uh, accounts you can make with different statuses and, and privileges. There are administrators, editors, and contributor levels that we have tacked onto for this tool. And we, you know, for, after working with a number of projects, we, we saw that you can have generally a, a linear workflow where you have crowdsourcing, you have students in, in classes, you have undergraduates you, you pay to do um, data curation and creation. And that can go through kind of a bottleneck of, of quality assurance of, say, editors, and then it gets published in the final form where the public can see it. So that's sort of the, the linear uh, project uh, workflow that we adopted and kind of piggybacked on the mechanisms that are in, in WordPress to do this. The data itself, once you have it in the, in the project, can be visualized in a number of different ways. You've got maps. You've got... Um, various kinds of network graphs, you've got timelines, um, and, and, and various other data visualization styles. Um, there's a number of different contexts, well, there's quite a number of different projects now that have been done uh, using Prospect, and some of them have been uh, pedagogical sort of projects that have been done in classes. Uh, it's also been used for creating exhibits in public spaces, museums, and there's a picture down here below of a, of a recent installation in a, a converted mill that has a, a small corner dedicated to local history. Uh, so <laughs> quickly getting to the challenges, uh, the lab, uh, our, our innovation is done by essentially two and a half positions. We don't have a lot of uh, time and resources to devote to evaluation. Mostly what's been done so far has been uh, through working through uh, collaborations with faculty, within classrooms, and focus groups. So one of the limitations is by, of course, working within the WordPress model, that doesn't always fit all of the scenarios you have for kinds of users, for feedback, for iteration through the data. So the single user hierarchy through a linear workflow doesn't fit a classroom setting very well, for example. And we've been working on other ways of accessing the data rather than just through the data visualization uh, window there so that there are other sorts of outputs for different kinds of users. So <laughs> there's my three minutes. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, we have, uh, extra, and I think we can try and keep the polls going until the next speaker comes up. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on. Oh, you're dying. Come on, come on. <laughs> Fantastic, like a Phil Spector Wall of Sound production now. Okay, ready? Yeah, can you change? Ah, it's not sorry, not mine. <laughs> we should just be able to minimize yeah. there. Uh, there we go. Okay, and I'll give you a minute warning. Okay. <laughs> 
So hi, my name is Esther. I'm from Exponia. We are a Swiss company doing mobile museum guide with digital wayfinding. And this paper we did with movement strategy, they based in London and they analyze movement data. And in this paper, I would like to highlight the importance of data analysis in culture and heritage sites and museums. So uh, big data is all around us. I just recently read, read a LinkedIn article about future jobs and this were all connected to data analysis collections or unfortunately not to museums, but <laughs> museums just can't ignore the trend of digital um, analysis and data analysis. So they have to take uh, advantage of it and they have to take care uh, how to make uh, it beneficial for themselves. And how, the, how data analysis can help uh, museums, it's a perfect example what movement strategy did in the, in the Tower of London, uh, where their aim was to increase uh, general visitor experience, safety and security and capacity, and for a better understanding to visitors. And they did uh, like movement analysis, and they could reduce, I think the most uh, important thing is that they could reduce queuing from 10 minutes to less than two minutes. I, I can tell you it's working because I just visited on a Friday. And what uh, Exponia comes in to uh, this word is that collecting data uh, can happen to many ways, but the most like the easiest way is to gather data with an application because it's automatically collected with beacons, uh, giving Bluetooth signals and is the easiest way to as visitors move around the space and you can gather data um, by their um, cell phones or their tablets and then companies like movement strategies or we can um, can kind of analyze it and make statistics for museums and it's very useful because museums can then monitor like visitor behaving and see where should they put an object, where should they um, lead the visitors to discover the whole area and basically um, it's anonymously collected so you don't have to worry about like personal rights or <laughs> like this kind of stuff and it's real time collected so as long as the visitors are actively moving and they, their Bluetooth are turned off, you will receive all the data immediately. And I think my time is up. <laughs> so <laughs> if you have any questions, just uh, I'm, I will be here. And also my contact information uh, is, and also my, um, the other colleagues' contact information is at the bottom of the poster, which is the blue and orange one on the first one. Thank you. So we have about oh, almost 10 minutes, I think, for questions, unless Fiona has made a late appearance. I think so. Uh, any questions for our poster presenters? Yeah. Um, about the uh, Bluetooth, how do you know what percentage of the visitors have Bluetooth on their phone that's switched on? So have you got any idea of what percentage of the overall visitors you're capturing using the app? Like how many visitors have Bluetooth on their phone? They have to turn it on. Each phone has Bluetooth. Or I don't really get it, sorry. <laughs> no, it's their own phone, yeah. yeah. Or the rentable devices. If, if, if you know, how many users have a phone that has Bluetooth on I mean, today, um, I guess the vast majority of visitors has a, has a smartphone. I mean, you can hardly meet uh, visitors with like the old, old style phones, I would say. And if a museum would ask them to switch the Bluetooth on, it will automatically generate the data. I think Ofcom do statistics on um, smartphone market penetration in the UK. I can't remember what the figure is, but uh, it's fairly high. Question back here. Yeah. 
Um, also a question about the um, IB uh, uh, use there. Were there any issues with um, uh, privacy and security and consent for uh, getting that, um, um, that kind of data uh, from users? How, how, how do they know what kind of data is collected from their phones? Uh, that it's anonymously collected. So the data is just like yes or no. So it's not like um, names or any other information about the user. And the user, they, they don't know, but you, you never know when you post something on Facebook, right? So today's world, I think everyone, I mean, there are companies who know everyone from everyone. <laughs> So you never know, but it's supposed to be anonymously collected. And as visitors, for example, like something on, in our application, I can tell, or if they share something, of course it's collected, but we don't know if, if who, who did it, so who collected it. Whether you need a microphone or not, but I'll pass it along. Thank you. 